Second Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 7 through 9a. We're going to hit the first, first statement there in verse 9. Let me say this before I, I start, though. I will be touching on a subject that is sensitive in the United States at this time, if not in the world. And that subject is uh, same-sex marriage, homosexuality, and lesbianism. I don't mean to offend anyone or to suggest that God is angry at those individuals. He's angry at the sin. And whatever sin that is, whether it is homosexuality or whether it's drunkenness or whether it's um, drugs or any other sin that's evil before God, he hates all sin, but he loves the sinner. He cares about them and he wants to see them saved and come to an understanding of who he is and receive eternal uh, salvation through the work of his son Jesus Christ. And so as I discuss these sins and so forth, there, it's only because it's in the context as we go through the Bible and it just happens that we're living in that age where we're dealing with it so much today, more than ever before. Uh, more than 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, we're seeing it uh, before our eyes uh, flaunted. And so we need to deal with that. And how do we as Christians... How do we react? How do we love these people? How do we share with them the gospel message? Um, these are important questions that we all need to answer and understand uh, what we believe according to the word of God. So our God knows how to, how to save, uh, and it's very clear. We see, see that in Noah during the flood, that God saved Noah out of his judgment and bringing the flood on the world. But he also knows how to destroy, right? He's a balanced God. He loves to save people, but he will also destroy them if they're rejecting his grace and his love. And so God can save, but yet God can also destroy. Peter understood this as he wrote this down in his little epistle here. He understands that God is a God of judgment, and he understands that God is a God that saves his people, those that love him, those that are righteous, those that are godly. Peter was in a situation where Herod, the king at the time, was persecuting the church. And he saw that the religious leaders, the Jews, were really excited about it. They were happy that he was doing that for them. And so he thought that he would continue to do so and even uh, seek after those that were in charge. And so he was able to capture Peter. And he put Peter into prison. And Peter laid there in prison. He was in shackles. The church was praying for him in John Mark's home and fasting and seeking the Lord that God would somehow deliver him out of this prison. And as Peter was praying and he fell asleep and he was in his deep sleep, the angel of the Lord came to him and said, wake up, Peter, let's go. And of course, he woke up in a daze and just kind of held his hand and followed him around. He went past the first guard. The first guard didn't see him. Then the second guard didn't see him. And they came to the gates. And the gates, the Bible says, opened of their own accord in the old King James. It just opened by themselves. And they walked through those gates and Peter was delivered. He was delivered by the hand of God as he sent angels uh, to help him. And so he understood deliverance, that God had that power and that ability, and not through normal means, but through angelic means, through divine means. And that's the power of God. And he is able to do anything. We need to remember that. Our God is mighty. He is able to conquer all those obstacles before us. And then Peter Shortly after Herod being praised by the people because of what he was doing to the Christian community, uh, the people began to call him a god. And so God struck him dead and the worms began to eat him as a king. And so again, the example of God's judgment on an individual. Peter understood that very clearly. We need to understand that. That God is a loving God under the New Testament. He's a very gracious God, a very patient God with us. And he's looking that no one should perish but all come to repentance. And he's so willing to open his arms up to all of us if we're willing to confess our sins and to say, I'm sorry, Lord, for my sins. I'm sorry for the way that I'm living my life. And I want to come to you in, in humility and in grace. And God is so willing to accept us once again into his family. But we also need to understand that God chastises and judges those that reject him. He will put you through situations. He will allow things to happen in your life if you're rejecting him, if you're neglecting your walk with him. He'll allow the world's temptations to come upon you. He'll allow situations to rise in your life to wake you up 
to hopefully shake you a little bit so that you know that I need to go back to God where it's safe, where I can find grace and love. If not, God will continue to chastise you. In fact, the New Testament even teaches unto the point where he will take your body to save your soul. 1 Corinthians 5 tells us that. God loves us that much if we continue to walk in sin. So last week, we really looked at the judgment of God. We saw in verse 4 how God didn't spare the angelic beings who were in heaven and they rebelled against God. And God judged them, casting them into outer darkness and into chains. These were beings that were so wicked that God wouldn't even allow them to go to earth. That's how bad they were. And thank God for that, otherwise we'd be in worse trouble than we are now. And then in verse 5, we saw how he did not spare the ancient world. The world at the time of Noah that was so wicked and so evil that even the imaginations and thoughts were corrupt. In other words, they couldn't get these corrupt thoughts out of their mind. They were constantly thinking of evil things. They were watching evil things. Today we would think about them as rapists and serial killers. We would think of them as uh, people that were into all kinds of sexual immorality and fornication and those things. They just can't get that stuff out of their mind. They were so engulfed by it and God judged them by bringing a flood upon them. And then in verse 6 we saw how he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes by bringing this sulfur fire down upon them. And then it says that... um, He saved Lot through all of this in verse 7. So we see here that the Lord saved Noah and his family from this evil world. He can also save and deliver righteous Lot from the world that he lives in. And the same God that brings destruction on the ungodly is the same God that rescues the righteous. Thank be to God for that, that he rescues the righteous. And we can rejoice in that, that he will rescue us in time of need. He will rescue you when you're in a situation if you call out to him. I think of Peter who was in the boat and the boat began to sink from the waves and the storm that was was flowing and Peter just said, Lord, help! And the Lord heard him and helped immediately. That is our God. And so today's theme is God delivers the righteous. God delivers the righteous. Look at verse 7. And delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. Let's stop there. Let me define some words here so that we understand the day and age that Lot was living, that it was very corrupt, it was very filthy, it was very wicked. And so we need to understand that so that we understand Lot. Oftentimes people think, uh, some of the commentaries that I read uh, s- expressed the thought that Lot really put himself in a bad situation, that he was just as guilty a- as the community that he lived in. He was a judge there in the community. He had his family in that community, dwelled there for 20 years. Well, why did he stay there? Why didn't he get out? He made a choice to go down there. And so he was just as guilty. But Peter doesn't interpret the Old Testament that way. He tells us the true heart of Lot, that he was literally oppressed from what was going on around him. And that doesn't sound like a man that was content in living and dwelling at that time. Sounds like a man that was upset at his environment and the society that he lived in. And so the scripture says that God delivered. And that word delivered literally means to draw or to snatch to oneself. So in a sense, God literally delivered Lot by pulling him out and drawing him into safety from what judgment was coming down upon Sodom and Gomorrah because of his righteousness, because he was right with God. He believed God that God was going to send the Messiah who would die for the sins of the world and that if we had faith in him, we would not perish. He believed in the promise that was coming You see, in the Old Testament, they did not believe in Jesus Christ. They believed in the Messiah. They believed that God was going to send a Messiah one day who would deliver them from their sins and from their enemies. And so in believing in that future tense, they were saved because they believed in that. In the New Testament, and for us today, we're saved because we believe in what Jesus did in the past. And so we are saved by our faith in Jesus Christ, what he did 2,000 years ago. And that is what saves us. So in the past of the Old Testament, they look to the future. In today's time, we look to the past and we're both saved by the Messiah, Jesus Christ. That is our righteousness. 
is our faith and belief in him. He has imputed his righteousness upon us. And so because he was righteous, God delivered him because of the oppression that he had in his heart, which was evidence to his righteousness, that he was oppressed by what was going on around him. That word oppressed there means worn down. You ever get worn down? Worn down by evil, worn down by wickedness, worn down by maybe an individual who's a liar, a deceiver, a conniver, and they just wear you down. You know, it just gets to the point where you get depressed and upset. Literally, to tie down with toil is what the word means. It becomes an oppression of the enemy because of the filthiness uh, conduct of these wicked people. And that word filthy really describes a people that is unbridled that is not satisfied with just some pleasure, but they want all the pleasure. Uh, They want to indulge themselves with excess, without restraints whatsoever. I mean, these are people that are just so corrupt that they can't stop thinking about it. And when you go back to Genesis and you read the account, as soon as these angels came in to save Lot, immediately the city men and women and even children came to him and said, hey, who are those men? Bring them to us. We want to get to know them. And they talked about sexually almost immediately because the the thoughts that were upon their minds at all times that the angels had to pull Lot and his wife and family into the house and then they closed the door and what did they do? They sent blindness to them that they were confused so that they could walk out and be um, set free from this disaster that was coming upon them. So, like Noah who was delivered from the flood, so Lot, from a fire of sulfur which would come upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Both Noah and Lot lived during the time where there were mockers and unbelievers. The New Testament tells us that Lot was oppressed by this filthiness of Sodom and Gomorrah. He spent 20 years there in s g Sodom and Gomorrah. Spent 20 years until the angel came, took him by his hand, took his family by his hand, and he led them out into the city. How would you feel if you were Lot? Put yourself in his situation. If you lived during that time, you made a choice because it was greener, you had a a situation where you had to move away from your family because of what was going on, and it was a time to leave, you would obviously choose a place where there's prosperity, where you could somehow make a living and dwell. And that's what Lot did. He went down there. And as you go down there, you realize these people aren't nice people. These people are wicked people, and there's wickedness all around you, not just the men and the women, but even the children you can't even trust. You don't even want to be friends or neighbors with them. And then you become a judge over them because you're trying to help them. You're trying to deliver them. You're trying to somehow give them some wisdom and direction in life. You know, and in a sense, they're overcoming you. And your heart is so broken because you see the pain and the wickedness that's going on in their lives continually. How do you feel about today? And what's going on today? Does it oppress you? Do you hate what's going on today? You know what I find? That the enemy has slowly put us into a warm pot of water and is turning the heat up. Slowly turning the heat up. You know, if you take a frog and you want to boil it, you don't turn the water completely hot. You know, turn that flame up so it's completely hot and then throw the frog in because what he'll do is he'll jump out. And then you got to run around trying to get that frog as it's slipping all over the place, right? So what do you do? You just warm the water up. Just enough so that when the frog gets in there, he's like, oh, this is nice. This feels good. A little jacuzzi, you know? And got a little drink in his hand and he's just going to enjoy himself. And then slowly as you're watching him enjoying himself, you just start to turn the heat up more and more and it hits 105 you know, and that's usually the limit where I'm at. 105 and it's like, yeah, it's really hot. The muscles are melting now. And then 200 and then all of a sudden the frog's cooked. It's ready to eat. Frog legs. The enemy's doing that to the church. I really believe so. Did it to Lot. He thought it was a great place to go. Started a business, became a judge. Everything seemed to be fine and the heat continues to turn up to the point where God would send fire down upon them to destroy them. We live in the same day and age today as that. And it seems like the church is slowly enjoying life. You know, enjoying what's going on around them. Comfortable. You know, a little warm, but okay. No big deal. You know, yeah, I'll vote. 
but I don't really have to vote, you know, because we're still okay. Yeah, but I won't get involved with political things because that's not what Christians do and get involved in political things and so forth. We don't make a stand against uh, homosexuality. We don't make a stand against evil. You know, we're still fine. There's still, you know, some righteousness in the world, but we're slowly seeing that that's coming to an end and the water's being heated up, you know, slowly. And now Christians are getting burnt because of it. I just read in uh, a London newspaper, less than a year after announcing her support for same-sex marriage, a UK-based worship artist whose songs are sung in America churches on any given Sunday has come out as a lesbian. Come out as a lesbian. This is a songwriter, Vicky uh, Beeching, who was introduced into the Christian music industry in 2002. Today she's now a, a, a newscast anchor woman. You know, but she talks about her lesbianism and coming out. She's an author of songs like Above All Else. Have you ever heard that song? That is a beautiful song. We just sang it on Monday night at the Couples Fellowship, and it just melted me because above all else, God is there. You know, above all else, God is so wonderful. You know, above all else. She's the author of Great Is Your Glory or Even Search Me. And then she even did a take on the hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. This is what she said. She said, outlined in her feminist uh, beliefs in an article entitled, Jesus Was a Feminist and So Am I. That's crazy. The heat is being turned up and Christians are falling for it and they're slowly dying. God, in a sense, is kind of separating the wheat from the tares right now. You know, he tells us in that little parable that as a church and as leaderships, we need to be careful not to separate the tares from the wheat. There are people in church that really aren't Christians. They profess to be Christians. They may have even uh, gone up to an altar call, but by the fruit in their lives, they're not Christians. Jesus gave a parable, says, can a, can a tree, a good tree, bear bad fruit? No, it can't. Does a bad tree bear good fruit? No, it doesn't. And so he says, so a tree is known by its fruit, right? And then he says, and if a tree bears bad fruit, what do you do? You cut it down and you throw it into the fire. He's very clear. And so there are, there are tares and there are goats within the body of Christ. Those that profess to know Christ, but by their works, they deny him. But I don't know who that is. Uh, some of you might be able to guess you know, and you've tried to make a logical guess because you're, you're looking at what they're doing or saying or maybe you just don't like them and so we make that guess. But we don't know. And so Jesus says, don't worry about it. You just minister to all of them. And he says, I will separate them. And it seems like he's doing that now. He's separating them. He's allowing them to go to that point where, of no return where now they're professing that they're lesbian. Or like we saw last week, those that profess that the Genesis and, and the Noah's account is myth. And it's not necessarily a literal translation. And these are pastor's kids that are saying this. And so we see the fire being turned up. We need to make a stand. We need to stand for righteousness. As hard as it is to stand for righteousness today, we need to do it. And it may mean that we're imprisoned, fined, uh, our 503 nonprofit status taken away because that is being threatened to the churches today. They're literally threatening churches if you continue to support these groups in these organizations. That's why... IRS is looking into nonprofit organizations. That's why they're doing all of this, you know, investigation because they're trying to separate the churches, the conservatives and so forth so that they can attack them, take away things from them so that hopefully they'll change uh, their ways. Are you tormented from all this? I mean, does it even upset you? It should. What's happening in Iraq with the beheading of children, does that upset you? You know, or are you one of these persons that, you know, I don't just turn the news off because I'm tired of hearing it? You know, I don't want to see those, those pictures that are going on on YouTube and, and on Facebook and Twitter and of these literally beheadings of, of young people and then their heads placed on stakes, you know. And you just don't want to see it. I just leave me alone. Let me just stay focused on my job and enjoying what I have at this time. I mean, do you even think that it's wrong? Because something's wrong with us if we don't. Something's wrong with us if we don't see the injustices that are taking place in our world today. Because they're happening today. 
And Lot was delivered from this way of life. And God can deliver us from this way of life. He can rescue us uh, from that life. Kind of like a lifeguard going out and rescuing someone that's drowning. Just recently in Newport Beach, there was a lifeguard. He was Christian. And his job is to pretty much be a watchman on a wall and watch what's going on and make sure that everybody is safe and join themselves you know, out there in the water and there's riptides he asks you to come in you know if you're boogie boarding too close to the pier he asks you to get away and so forth that's his job and his job is also that if he sees someone drowning or struggling he goes out there and he helps them out well that's what he did and he ended up dr- drowning because he saved this life and what an example What a type of Christ who died in our place to save us. So God can deliver us like a lifeguard who delivers someone that's drowning so God will rescue us from that time of his great judgment that is coming. Peter here explains a little bit more on Lot's situation in the world in verse 8. Let's look at that. For what righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds or literally without law. There are no restraints. And isn't that what's happening today? We are creating laws that say there is no law against sodomy, against same-sex marriage, against those things that we believe are sin in the eyes of God, and they're beco- we're becoming a lawless society in a sense, aren't we? But it's being done legally. Kind of strange. And people's eyes are blinded to this situation. Here's Lot, a righteous man, dwelling, literally living in this home like we live in this community. And by the way, this is happening here in the United States. Not necessarily in other nations, A lot of other nations are against all of these things, but only here in the United States because of our liberal thinking and liberalism. And so he's living in this place among them, being tormented, his righteous soul, day after day after day after day. We're seeing this and hearing it. There's a a website called townhall.com. It says the media elite gloat at their report as a judge has forced New Jersey to become the fourth state, 14th state to honor and celebrate gay marriage. When homosexuals marry in Hoboken, the gay left will be or should be thanking Hollywood. Judges who are making those moral judgments on our society. They say today there are 42% gay scenes on our television, 42% more. I could remember back when Three's Company came out and that was such a scandal when you had a man and two women living together that weren't married. That was a huge scandal. And that was in the 80s. But that was the worst that it got. Today, we're seeing way beyond that, 42% gay scenes. Uh, uh, Maggie Purcell writes, today television shows are widely praising for their portrayal of different characters sexually. And you're seeing this on television. Our children are seeing this. You're seeing it. Here's where that warm water comes into play, where we're watching this stuff and it's slowly indoctrinating us. Uh, And it's indoctrinating the Christians. That's what's strange. I don't know how many Christians that I have run into that call themselves Christians, that are literally living with somebody. They're not married, but they're living with the individual in the same home and in the same bed. And they think that they're Christians and that God is okay with that because we love each other, we're committed to each other, and it doesn't matter what a piece of paper says because this is what Hollywood has been telling us for years. Uh, You see that with Kurt uh, Kurt Russell and um, Goldie Hawn who has been living forever. And so you see those type of things and people think, well, they do it. What's wrong with it? They love, they care. They're just compassionate. They're committed. So why can't we do it also? Because they don't read their word. And so they're doing it. And I see that all the time. And these are educated people that don't have a problem doing this. And we're seeing it on television. Modern family. A same-sex couple life 
is shown through their relations with their families and raising children. You know, they're making them real. These are people. They love each other. They're compassionate. They have the same type of, you know, things happen to them also. Again, the water's warming up. It's warming up. There's also shows aimed at young adults that are receiving attention for their depiction of gay and lesbian characters, such as Glee, the show Glee. It's a nice show. Very talented people sing and they dance and so forth, but at the same time, they're slowly indoctrinating. It's okay to be gay. It's okay to be lesbian and so forth. Uh, Pretty Little Liars, I don't know what that show's about. But just the the name itself, Pretty Little Liars, right? So it's pretty to be little liars. You're not a big liar, but you're a pretty little liar. You know, just strange. Lying is wrong completely. And here's the catcher. Even Disney Channel has shown a same-sex couple on the show, Good Luck Charlie. Have your kids watched that show, Good Luck Charlie? With some black backlashing claims that since Disney is intended for children, that they should seek merely to entertain and not to push an agenda. And this is the response from Disney. On the contrary to this argument is the idea that same-sex couples are becoming more and more normal, thus they should make it recognizable to children. See, they understand that market. They see that happening in the world. And so why aren't we helping it why aren't we letting kids know what it looks like it's our job to do that and the heat is turning up and we're starting to boil but what do we do what can we do because we're headed towards the days of noah aren't we aren't we living in the days of noah i think we are we're 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 partying we're drinking we're giving in marriage we're enjoying life you know that's america right there it's the days of noah what do we do as believers We have a responsibility. I know this church does as much as it can. We're involved politically. We make sure that you have the opportunity to sign up to vote. And we make sure that we equip you so that you know how to vote. Uh, We get people coming down here and they go through all the ballots. They tell you who are Christian, who are not Christian. How they voted on Christian conservative or whether they didn't vote on Christian conservative. We even tell you about the ballots and the initiatives down to the T so you understand it very clearly. And yet a lot of people still don't vote. When Prop 8 came out, we were on the street over there on Limonite in Hamner, and we had signs, and we were picketing, and we were spit at, and we were laughed at, we were honked at, but we were out there doing that. Because I believe that we need to be proactive in these things as a church. We're a small church, but we're powerful. And God sees that, and He sees the faithfulness of this church. You see, a church is designed to basically do two things. And that is to reach the world for Christ. That's our first priority. People get it confused. They think church is a country club. You know, they think church is a a place where we come because we want to give to God something, you know, so that he blesses us with something. And that's not what church is about. Uh, It it should be comfortable. It should be air conditioning. It should have comfortable seats. It should have, you know, food available and, and all kinds of resources for my kids and, you know, all these, you know, these things. That's what people think. It's a country club. And in reality, church is a place where we bring the lost to come to Christ. Or we go out there in the streets and we bring Christ to them. And that's what we're doing with this summer fest. Going out to them for 11 weeks. We have no resources, and yet God is blessing it without the resources. We have enough to buy some food, and we, give out, we gave out 150 hot dogs and chips and candy uh, to the kids. Uh, we were able to buy some of these little gummy bears. Packages, they went wild over those things. They were blown away. They, were, they kept playing games and just piling them in their pockets and then everywhere they could. They were excited. They know Jesus loves them over there. They know that, and that's what we're doing. Church is about that, not being comfortable. We had a lady leave one time because the bathroom was occupied. She couldn't even hold it enough for God. <laughs> the second thing is that we're to be here to be equipped to be more like Christ. We come to church so that we understand what is it to be like Christ? How are we to be like Christ? What do I need to change to be like Christ? How can I be more effective like Christ was effective in the world? How can I love more? How can I have mercy? How can I have grace? How can I take a whip and have anger and beat the money changers that are coming in the church? I've had to do that here in the church. People have come in and tried to fleece the flock in a sense. 
You know, we've had that from time to time. We had a guy come in here, and he was selling some sort of uh, cards for lawyers. And he was going around to every single person. You need a lawyer. You need a lawyer. Come on, join my club, and I'll give you a card, and you have a lawyer available to you the whole time. You know, that was fine if you, you, you come here, you create relationships, and outside of the church, you tell them you have something. But then to come to the church for just barely a week and already hitting everybody up, finally we had to say, what are you doing here? Well, I'll come to worship God. Really? Because I don't see that. I see you're coming to fleece God's people. You know, oh, no, no way. I'm trying to help them. They might need a lawyer. They might need some help. I go, no, you're trying to fill your pockets with their resources. You know, your heart's wrong. You want to come here and worship? I don't want to hear anything about, about lawyers and cards and clubs and joining. He was even getting the kids, talking to the kids about it, you know. I said, no, you come here to worship. Do you think he came back? didn't come back because that's not why he was here you know, we have to be careful of these people you know, they come around we need to stand up how can I be more like Christ how can I love how can I express that love well by hanging around Jesus more that's how getting in your word praying hanging around Christians that are active and involved we need to be more like Christ because we're headed in the days of Noah and judgment is coming and God knows how to deliver his people out of that Jesus said, as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. So as the days of Noah, so will be the day of the coming of the man. That means the coming of the Son of God is soon. He's coming back soon. If we can see it all around us, everywhere we go, you can go on campus here to Harupa Valley, and you will see two boys holding hands or two girls making out in the halls and so forth. It's happening right now. It's very open if you don't see it already, if you don't see it on television, if you don't see it on the movies that you're watching. It's all over the place. They are very aggressive. You don't hear this in the news quite often, but they will literally go to churches and burn them down. They will graffiti all the churches and write hate you know, on the churches because we hate homosexuals again let me be very clear if you're hearing this message and trying to break it up god loves you you know god loves you he hates the sin he hates adultery he hates fornication he hates homosexuality also he hates all those things so peter here though notice that he calls lot righteous there are always a remnant there's always a group that are righteous always a group that are on fire for god you know usually in churches it's 10 percent 10% of the church is actively involved in that church. And that's roughly correct because we have about, we have a little bit over about 12% of the body are involved in what's going on here. But other than that, you know, the other 90 to, you know, 87% aren't necessarily involved. They're coming, they're sitting and they're going and they're just coming and sitting and going. I hope you don't do that. You know, I don't mean to offend you, but I hope you get involved. I want your Christianity to be an active Christian uh, servant type of attitude. Wherever you go, whether you stay here or you go somewhere else, you need to be involved because that's what God wants us to do. So there are always the righteous. Lot was called righteous here. Um, righteous because of his faith in what was coming, in the Messiah that was coming. And then we see in verse 9, that first statement, Peter repeats himself again to remind us that God delivers us. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. God is a God that delivers. Now, when judgment comes, he will deliver us out of that judgment. Titus is very clear that we're not appointed on the day of wrath. Uh, an example here with Lot. God's fire was coming down about Sodom and Gomorrah, and God would remove Lot and his family. Of course, one of them looked back, his wife, she turned back around and she turned into a pillar of salt because she was too tied to the world. Couldn't let it go. And so God saved Lot, took, took them out before his destruction. Noah was taken out before the flood came and drowned everyone. So we have a type here of God's rapture. The church being taken out before his judgment comes. So God knows how to deliver us. And if you're righteous and you believe in Jesus Christ and you're walking with God because Matthew chapter 24 talks about the end times. It talks about how two will be in the field working. One will be taken and one will be left. Two will be in, in the wine vats. One will be taken and one will be left. 
And he's talking about those that will be raptured and those that will be left behind. They're both Jewish, they're both working, they're both busy, but one of them is left, the other one is taken. What's the criteria of the one being taken and the one being left? That's the question that we should be worried about. That's why John 15 says, if we abide in Christ, he will abide in us. And so let us abide in Christ let us walk with him. Let us be ready at all times. And we don't have to worry if we meet the criteria at all. So being ready because our God delivers us. But our God also delivers us out of temptation, doesn't he? And that's what we're involved in today. We struggle with the temptation of this world. Like Lot's wife who struggled with the tie to this world. She struggled with it. She didn't want to leave it. She was the one that, that still wanted to dwell there, still wanted to live there. You know, I can almost imagine being a woman, and this is just supposition, but you know, this is my home. You know, this is, this is where my furniture, and this is where my animals are. This is what I built, you know, my, my little house, and you're telling me to leave. I can't leave. I'm, I'm too tied to it. And God says, you need to leave it alone. That's why we need to be uh, uh, holding on to our things very lightly, because God could call us away at any moment. God delivers us out of those temptations. She wasn't willing uh, to let go of those things. But God is able, not just from those uh, temptations, but also the temptations of the enemy who throws at us constantly. Whether it's billboards, whether it's television, whether it's at work, whether it's joking around, whether it's drinking, whatever it is, the enemy is throwing temptations to stumble you, to derail you. Or it could be our flesh. Just our flesh is subject to certain temptations. And it's all different for every one of us. One person can have a temptation for one thing and another person can have a temptation for another. So we see some observations here that we can make concerning Lot. First of all, God knows how to deliver us from these temptations that we face. Very clear that God delivered him you know, and his family. So God is able. We need to understand that. That God has power. He has the ability and the resources. He can send angels down if that's what he desires to do. But he is able to deliver us. He can deliver you. There's, there's no temptation that can overcome you that God can't handle. And you're not the only one going through it. You're not the only case. And this is the case that finally, God, here's something you can't do. You know, no, God can do it. He's more than able to do it. One, the Christian is not to be preserved from temptation. He is not to be preserved from temptation. Matthew 6.13, Jesus said in his prayer, lead us not into temptation. That was his prayer. See, temptation, God isn't going to preserve us through it. He's not going to keep us in it. He's going to deliver us from it. That was his prayer to the disciples. You want to know how to pray? This is how you pray. Pray that the Lord leads you not into temptation. And so you need to be praying. When temptations arise, you get on your knees, you start praying, Lord, help me, deliver me, remove this temptation, get me out of here, let me run, as Romans said earlier, be like Joseph, when temptation came, flee, take off, turn that TV off, you know, whatever it takes, you need to run from it through prayer, because we're tempted by the devil, we're tempted by our sinful flesh, and it's easy to fall into that temptation. Two, they will be preserved in temptation, God will help us while we're being tempted. Like Lot here, God will preserve you in those temptations. He will help you. See, Lot did not give in to the temptations. I'm sure he was tempted quite often. When a beautiful woman came to him, or a man tempted him, you know, or the lifestyles tempted him, he dwelled there for 20 years. You know he was tempted, and yet he was able to resist it through God's power. In fact, it oppressed him more than anything else. He hated it despised it that's what we need to do with sin we need to start praying lord would you give me a heart that hates sin that hates whatever it is that tempts you so that it doesn't defeat you when you give in to it third <clears throat> they will be delivered out of it they will be delivered out of it he can rescue his people from trials and judgments that come god is able to do so Paul tells us in Corinthians that the things that are written in the Old Testament were written for our examples. These are examples for us to know that God can deliver us from our temptations. If we are willing to pray and relinquish those temptations to him, he will take them from us.
Let me close. God's people, as weak as we are, will be delivered from the judgment that is coming upon this world by His grace and His mercies alone. It's not by what we do. It's not by what we profess. It's by God's grace and mercy that He delivers us. It's His work and it's His grace if we have faith in Him. God could not judge Sodom and Gomorrah until Lot and his family were out of the city. We're out of the city. So we can also be assured that God will not judge us until we're gone. Sometimes we think, well, God's judgment's coming. You know, how, what are we going to go through? Some nuclear blast, some radiation. You know, people are going to die. We will be out of here when God's wrath comes. That's not going to happen. Likewise, it's my belief that God will not send that wrath into this world until he takes his people out of heaven. Thessalonians says, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but unto salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or asleep, we should live together with him in heaven. So one day soon, when this fiery sulfur comes down upon this world, we will be taken out. Are you ready? Are you ready? See, we should be, we should be like that frog that is thrown into the fire. We jump out of it right away. You know, don't get caught up in the lukewarm stuff. Don't tempt the Lord. By thinking you can get away with it. By thinking you're okay. That you're doing fine. That you're the exception to the rule. No, you're going to get burnt if you do. Give that unto the Lord. Jude tells us that God has saved others by snatching them from the fire. So another example that God will deliver us on that day of judgment when fire comes upon this world. He will deliver us. Snatching us up into the world. But he will also deliver us from the fire to come. To come against this world, against the unbeliever. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, he can deliver you by you simply giving him your heart and believing in him and he will give you eternal life. The Bible is very clear. It's not difficult to understand. Jesus said, I did it all for you. I went to the cross. I bore your sins upon that cross. And when I died, I was punished for your sins. And so the punishment was already given out. It was already handed out. And so there's no more punishment to give out because I already took it. What you need to do is believe that he took it and that it's done, that it's over. And God says you will have eternal life if you believe that God did that for you already. It's really that simple. There's no work that you have to do. There's nothing that you have to accomplish. You don't have to be good 100% of the time. We should achieve to be 100% of the time, you know, eventually when we get to heaven, but we should be striving for that. But we won't be, but the heart is there. But our salvation is not based upon that. It's based upon the work of Jesus Christ alone. And we need to put our faith in him. And if you haven't done that, then I pray you do that today. That after the service, come up here and talk with someone and give your heart to Christ so that you could have eternal life. If you're a Christian that's in this world and you are slowly being cooked, get out of the pot. Get out of the world. We're not a part of this world. There's that slogan, right? Not of this world. That should be taken literally. We're not of this world. I was telling my grandkids on the way over here, I had Gabby and and Abigail with me. And I said, Jesus told his disciples that the birds have nests. The foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know, birds, they'll make nests in trees, in shrubs, sometimes under eaves of of houses, and they will mate and they will have other birds and they will make a home for themselves because this is their home. The foxes will find a, a spot and they'll dig a hole deep and create a a little nest underneath the ground and they will have other foxes and other little babies and they will create a home and Jesus says but I I don't have anywhere to lay my head it's not that he couldn't purchase a home couldn't have a place he had no place to lay his head because this wasn't his home that was my point to them his home is in heaven his home was with the Father, and he is a sojourner. He was a vagabond, in a sense, journeying on a mission to reach the world, and then he was going to return home. 
You, we want to be more like Christ? There you go. Be like Christ. Hang on to this world very loosely. This isn't our home. Our home is in heaven. Let's get the gospel out. Let's be more like Christ. That's what God wants to do in us and through us.